Hello and welcome. I am Manish Anand, the Raisina Hills. Uh, welcome you all. Uh, welcomes you all to a special discussion on a raging debate about moonlighting. Uh, Vapro has just uh, recently uh, sacked about 300 employees uh, on charges of uh, them being doing moonlighting. Uh, we have with us two very special guests, uh, Ambassador Sashank and uh, uh, Mr. Deepak Upreti, uh, who is uh, uh, the associate editor of the Pioneer newspaper. To begin with, uh, Ambassador Sashank, uh, uh, we would like to see the foreign perspective on moonlighting because we have uh, still a lot of uh, a lack of uh, clarity on the subject. Well, there are several international aspects of moonlighting. It affects India's economic cooperation with other countries, including the various FTA negotiations which we have with on a bilateral or a regional or international basis. We have the question of inviting foreign companies to come and invest in India, and also Indian companies investing abroad or getting jobs abroad as subcontractors or in whatever way. So I will go one by one. I think I have had experience of Indian companies working in the Arab countries, Gulf countries, and in their other North African countries. And everywhere I found that they have to compete very uh, in a focused manner with foreign companies, especially those from the Southern European countries who were quite willing to employ many of the Indians with them. And we found that uh, to compete with them effectively, the Indian companies would lower their uh, quotations. And at the same time, they would lower the uh, living standards of their employees. And they will make sure that these employees don't leave them and start working with the other European companies uh, at higher salaries. Because the European companies would normally go and tell these governments in Arab countries that Indians don't give human treatment to their employees, to their workers, we can give it to them. So you will not come under criticism from the, uh, your people or from the international markets. So therefore, this is one issue which we have to keep in mind that in order to compete at the international level, you have to make sure that your employees, while they are qualified equally with other employees, they do not get uh, paid too little or their living conditions are not too bad. And that is something which I have, many um, workers came and complained to me that they were not given proper food or they were being given food in paint boxes, which were smelling still of paint uh, because the companies did not want to buy the kitchen utensils, so things of that kind. So these were this is one aspect. The second aspect is that Indian companies going for subcontracting work in the developed countries. Once again, in order to win the comp the competition from let's say coming from Israel, Ireland, and many other countries which have similar strength in the software services, the Indian companies normally uh, give lower quotations. At the same time, they keep their employees under tremendous control so that they don't run away and get jobs outside. So they are helped in some ways by the visa requirements that on the L1 visa, for example, in USA, employees cannot change their jobs. H1B visas, yes, they can do that. So I think these are the kind of issues which I have seen. And many times these companies employ Indian intelligence or Indian police officers to keep a watch over their uh, workers. Uh, I felt very sad in many of these cases, but I must share these things very frankly, that there's a question of competition, there's a question of Indians getting jobs outside, but at the same time, making sure that it is not considered as a kind of a mini police state uh, run by these companies abroad. Third, we come to the uh, FTA negotiations with other countries and inviting investments in India. And I have seen in many cases, that there is a shortage of qualified manpower in India. And these workers are willing to jump jobs with $10 per month additional income. And uh, they don't have that kind of experience which one is supposed to get. So what happens is that there are two aspects. One is that the Indian education system, especially for STEM subjects, is very uh, restrictive in the sense that we allow only very limited type of uh, institutions to give four year, five year of education. And 
many times we find that these are given on the basis of affirmative action or reservations for SC, ST, and other OBCs that's other categories. So what happens is that there are people who are employed in the government sector and many sectors, but they're not employable as such in the international uh, conditions. So one aspect becomes that when the foreign investor comes to India, he finds that there are very few uh, Indians who are available. So they would try to get people from Wipro, they will try to get people from Tata's or from other people because they are the only ones who have experience uh, of working in international kind of a competitive environment. So that is one. Second is that uh, we, we don't have enough uh, educational kind of a situation. I remember having an ambassador in Korea, I found that most of their major companies had their own STEM education institutes. So they would make sure that whatever new technologies are coming in, the youngsters are trained in those technologies and those fields. In our case, of course, we have this issue that the government institutions will have to go back uh, 30, 40 years or maybe 80 years to see what kind of education system they have to follow. UGC will decide and uh, many other institutions, governmental institutions and people who were trained about 50 years ago, they are the ones sitting uh, in, in decision making. Whereas in private sector, things change very, very rapidly and technology has changed. And so people can lose jobs very quickly. So like we find that brick and mortar kind of institutions, uh, shops and corporate groups, they're losing their markets and everything is going uh, online. And COVID has really further strengthened that process. So these are the issues I would like to mention. Finally, I would say that these various uh, bilateral FTAs or regional FTAs, like we have the RCF, uh, negotiations with the East Asian countries. So we try to tell them that we are very much a part of the supply chain process and we can gradually replace China, uh, which is not following the human rights standards, which is not, it's a very opaque uh, visa system. So we can perhaps join the other country. Then suddenly our companies in India, they become very frightened that if foreign companies come and invest in India, then all their employees will be removed and taken away by these foreign companies. So they get after the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, they get after the various NGOs in India, and they say, we will not allow the government to move ahead to give an access to the foreign companies to get market in India. And that is our exclusive market. We would not like to share it with anyone else. So this is the problem which we are facing. The government has a political issue. They have to come back to power after winning the elections. So they need funding support from the business houses. They need the voting support from the poorer people, workers. And we are not able to find a good solution to this. I think these are the various issues which I thought I should mention. And we need to take care of them and, and think over them very, very seriously. Of course, uh, Ambassador Sasank has given a broad view about uh, the foreign ecosystem on employer and the employee relationship. Uh, uh, Mr. Deepak Opreti, he is the associate editor of the Pioneer. Are you able to hear me, Mr. Opreti? Mr. Opreti, can you listen? Yeah, to yeah, me? yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah Mr. Opreti, uh, we have heard what uh, Ambassador Sasank uh, gave us uh, the insight about the foreign perspective. But in India, we see that uh, the employer and the employee relationship is quite hostile and uh, uh, people have no option but to indulge in moonlighting. Uh, how, what is your perspective on the topic? Uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, this moonlighting term has come into vogue uh, recently only. Earlier, we uh, didn't know what is moon and lighting, you know. Uh, now, uh, this uh, because moonlighting otherwise was thought that only when the one who is in job, he goes back and moon is there. Is, after his job, he's taking another job. You know, that is. So uh, what I'm saying that it is, uh, it is said, uh, described as a second job or um, second timing by those who don't like it. Now, this uh, uh, Premji, the Vipro chief, uh, he had sacked 300 employees. And after that, the debate started and it went viral and many people thought that it was illegal. Now, from Premji's point of view, it was cheating on his company and uh, thereafter, a debate had started. Now, in India, unlike the West, 
the perspective, very good perspective given here. Uh, India, things are very different. Here, the joblessness, the disparities in income, per capita income, and uh, mm, that has a, uh, that has a, that needs to be kept in mind when we discuss about someone taking a second job. Now, per capita income in India is, if I may give a, a figure of 2021, is around about 93, now 91,000 or so. So it comes less than 10,000 rupees. Now, the point is anybody who is in the white collar job, if uh, uh, he wants to make both hand, both hand meet, then he goes for a second job, you know. So now there are two things, whether uh, this moonlighting should be justified in terms of making both hands meet or in, uh, in, uh, increasing one's income. These are two aspects. If uh, the kind of employability or the kind of income average Indian has, there the, it is moonlighting or second job that uh, cannot be called unethical or illegal. You know, say there, there, there's a, uh, when the debate started on social media, many said that even Premji is in board of many directors, many companies. So it is unethical, even entrepreneurs running many uh, enterprises. So they are also moonlighting in a way. So, uh, and uh, this uh, aspect has came, come after the post COVID situation and it turned uh, the employment uh, conditions very bad. And uh, so um, what I'm saying, the two things need to be discussed, whether uh, these, uh, with the terms used as legal or illegal, these need to be uh, viewed in a different aspect post COVID. Indeed, uh, indeed, Mr. The, Prithi, uh, yeah. indeed, Mr. Prithi, you have uh, uh, given a new perspective that uh, the employers are themselves on different boards and they are running different enterprises. But uh, hmm. Ambassador Sashank, uh, they expect the employees to be uh, only loyal to one contract, one company, uh, work for only for that job and not undertake uh, extra work which can boost their income. Uh, do you think that the same thing happen, uh, happens in the West also, in the US uh, or the European countries? Well, I remember the case of the Indian doctors uh, working in America at a time when Americans were drafting youngsters for the Vietnam War. Then many young people moved away to Europe for various courses where they would be able to avoid draft. And Indians got a chance to make money as doctors, as nurses, as various other young teachers and scientists. Well, all kinds of jobs opened up to Indians and not only Indians, but many other developing countries uh, who did not have this draft obligation. And at the same time, the market was available. There was a shortage of qualified manpower. Now, most of these people were able to become millionaires almost because they were moonlight. They were working in their hospitals, their uh, institutions during daytime. And at night, they were able to work privately and do whatever they wanted. And the, the local governments just did not object to it because they were really short of manpower. So they wanted to keep these people somehow or the other. I had another example. I was in Egypt and I found that in Egypt, there was again another draft. Every young person had to be put in the army for two years. And after two years, the government was obliged to give them a job, about 26 pounds per month or so, which was barely enough for them to eat their bread. So everybody had to get two or three jobs and the government did not object to it. So most people will come to their government offices and there would not be enough chairs. So they would then leave and run taxis or run tuition services things of that kind that will happen and we have seen something like this happening in many other countries also so it's a question of the governments of course take a broader view that they want people to live well otherwise there will be a kind of a revolt type of a situation if you raise keep raising the prices of commodities and don't give enough remuneration to your people 
but private companies don't have that obligation private companies try to see that they make maximum profits in our case what we have done that quietly the government has become a partner with the private corporations giving them lot of tax benefits giving them all kinds of market access within india and giving support from the indian uh, business associations governmental agencies abroad to gain market access there but we don't give the same thing to our people we put all kinds of restrictions on them quite likely i mean i remember reading in the autobiography of lee kuan yew who said that the uk and us benefited tremendously and they kept encouraging india to give all kinds of uh, jobs to unemployable people internationally so that those uh, capable people meritocracy people they could be then taken over on jobs by americans and the britishers so lee kuan yew said that i will offer them the same jobs to young bright people from india from pakistan from malaysia from other countries and i will give them better opportunities than in the than in the west uh ended uh, yeah please go ahead mm. uh anand what uh, i want to say that see when uh, you see with the changing times things need to change and in the indian context where joblessness so rampant there's legality ethics i mean these have to be seen in a from the perspective of the one who is make who is trying hard to make both ends meet now we are talking about only of the white collar jobs you see there was uh, one chap who said in the social media that i i allow my uh, mate to work in five other places you know so it may be said in a jocular fashion but still uh, the point i'm saying that uh, uh, it in the indian context say bagging is illegal but if beggar is making his both ends meet by bagging then uh, either government intervenes or uh, private sector intervenes and changes the situations otherwise uh, uh, calling moonlighting or second job unethical that is from their perspective i mean those uh, companies perspective or even from government perspective the one who need to earn and um, uh, and, and give uh, his family support Uh, for him uh, sell uh, for him uh, ethics and legality uh, this uh, definition also changes isn't it of course sir. the point course, is sir. that, that course, in, in your own field in your own field uh, there are uh, big newspapers who uh, pay peanuts to journalists and then they think that they should keep uh, up for the flag of journalism high <laughs> so uh, if they are doing a two timing a quote and quote then uh, what is wrong there and uh, as much, uh, uh, as far as i know that uh, recently swiggy the ceo said that we don't mind our employees uh, serving any other company after uh, office hours so in fact he has said it is the uh, future of the work i mean this kind of situations now so i am saying that things need to change definitions need to be need to change ethics legality in context of such a vast joblessness you know that need to be changed you cannot have a bolie dand out you can say this is legal or illegal no it won't uh, it can go forever now india uh, indian country going in the third world the kind of joblessness we have and uh, the, the say non white collar job uh, laborers if they do uh, uh, earn their livelihood from one uh, contractor then go to another contractor uh, it is uh, i mean they are earning by the sweat of their bro is government or private uh, uh, companies giving them option that they should live their life happily by earning thousands of dollars of course so, of course uh, yeah. ambassador shashank uh, Uh, the minister for it rajiv chandrashekar also reacted after vipro sacked 300 employees that the time has changed and the companies need to realize that innovations uh, do uh, take place with such uh, uh, um, professional works and this is the norm in the west uh, which india cannot stop do you think that uh, the government should step in and uh, encourage the private employers to uh, promote such uh, such an ecosystem 
uh, where there is a healthy uh, relationship between the employer and the employees. I agree with you. Looking ahead, we need to think about all these various innovative measures to upgrade the uh, capabilities of our young people, number one. So any initiative that they take to upgrade their skills, to get greater experience, et cetera, should be encouraged. And one can say that all right, if you have these kind of qualifications, these are the job requirements which are there, then there could be some a band of uh, income which can be given, the number of hours which can, should be given for that. And beyond that, it should be a question of conflict of interest. That's all. It should not be a question of working elsewhere and gaining more experience. And if I remember that NIIT was the first institution which started educating young computer engineers and made a tremendous impact on the IT services in Indian market in India, that earlier everybody had to enter only the governmental IITs, et cetera, and other regional training institutions for five-year course. These guys gave six-month course and they say, well, after six months, you can get some job. And in the evenings, you can take another six-month course, upgrade your skills. And in case you stand first in any of the courses, their next course will be free. So I think there are all kinds of encouragements which are given and nobody minded that. I mean, we encourage all these kind of things. So once again, when we are talking of the next industrial revolution, the IT, the internet of things, we need to really think about a situation that the competition will not be only among human beings and corporates, corporation. Competition will be between the artificial intelligence, robotics, and the human beings. So do we want human beings to become intelligent, to become sharper, more focused in what they are trying to do rather than simply act as a, uh, some kind of a labor uh, person who can be given any kind of direction and has to work there. I mean, I, if you remember that we had replaced the slave labor uh, in the past and we had become the Grimitias. So under the agreements, we sent all our young bright people to work hard in the agricultural farms and the mines, et cetera, in replacement of the slave labor. Now, are we now replacing the uh, that Grimitia kind of a thing within India with these kind of contract labors that we are now we have complete control over their body, we have complete control over their sleep, complete control over where they go, what they do. I mean, I have no doubt that our police people would be very happy that after retirement, at least they would be able to make some money keeping control over others. But I don't think it's good for the country. Indeed, uh, Mr. Upreti, very uh, valid point uh, that um, the contract system or the labor laws that we have, uh, they are yeah. hardly enforced. The government does uh, uh, frame uh, uh, laws and rules in uh, supposedly in the welfare of the people, of the employees, but they are hardly enforced. The employers flout them uh, at their whims and fancies. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, referring to the leftist theory, but the point is this this surplus labor you know the uh, through that making more money by uh, explo uh, exploitation a mercenary kind of attitude by the contractors and that is rampant say like uh, i've seen uh, laborers uh, with their babies you know and in uh, in arm particularly the migrant workers you know they uh, have nowhere to go in in, in the rain hot sun uh, there are no conditions made over the years, in the 75 years down the line, uh, to make them more safe, feel that they are wanted, they belong to uh, this earth. I mean, situation is so bad. And uh, other kind of exploitation I'm not referring to, which comes in the purview of law and order. So it is a responsibility of private sector, government, and all of us to first change the employer's uh, you know, point of view. Uh, employers, employability should improve. Say so like the kind of management system we, has, uh, we are taught at the top level. It doesn't say, uh, it doesn't refer to you know, a happy employee. A happy employee would, uh, would give you more uh, good production, a quality of work. That is never talked about. The management always talks the highest profit, how to earn the highest profit. That will always be uh, detrimental to the fate of uh, employee and happiness. So uh, even management correct. systems, they need also they need to change. Our definitions correct. have we have taken from West, you know, definitely, and uh, it doesn't have a root in our own soil. So if happens, then the possibly 
employer would also understand that if I am paying 10,000 rupees to a, in a white collar job of 25,000 rupees, it doesn't work. So if he says, sir, I want to work outside, he should be happily uh, be agreeing to this. Isn't it? Indeed, indeed, indeed. So, uh, and so, Sasanka, so the uh, con uh, con contract system in, uh... also need to change. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Prati. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sashank, we see that the Google is headed by a person who was once employee. Apple is headed by somebody who was once an employee. But in India, we see that except for Tata's, all the companies are, we see, family oriented. And maybe the problem lies uh, there. Well, that is the reason why the families will prosper, but the country will not prosper. That's number one. Secondly, one has to also keep in mind that companies like Google and uh, uh, Microsoft and all the other foreign companies, what they do, they pick up young, bright people in very large numbers from the Indian institutions, whether they are given any job or not. But idea is that they should not be able to go to their rivals. So that is how they don't mind paying them certain amount of money. Now, if Vipro is following that similar kind of policy in order to compete with the other that employ as many people as possible, even though you don't have enough jobs for them, you cannot satisfy their hunger for work. And then these people start doing some second jobs or third job, and then you immediately come down harshly on them. So these are the kind of issues that there are a lot of issues which have to be kept in mind. And I think Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar is the right person. I think he deals with a very new area of technology. And, and I have met him on a few occasions. I think he, some of the brighter people in our government and those outside, they should really get together thinking that if we are thinking of India to become the, uh, what they call the world guru, uh, you cannot become like this, you know, by making your people a slave labor or, or just getting at very, very uh, cheap rates, offering all your labor to them, because then they will be just moved around from one place to place. They will be played against one against the other. And your companies will make benefit only out of uh, this slave labor kind of a situation and throwing out people whenever they don't need them. Indeed. Uh, on this note, uh, we should uh, wrap it up uh, the discussion. It was very insightful. Uh, Mr. Sashank and Mr. Upreti gave a lot of insight and we will carry on the debate on the topic in our next episodes. Uh, do share the link of the channel with your friends and relatives. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sashank and Mr. Upreti. Thank you so much. Thank you.